Hello, my name is Jeff Wagner. For the next little while, we're going to have a look at prepping assets and bringing them into Solaris. Uh, as we're working on the Magic Market set, um, we, we took a look, or we will be taking a look at all the different facets of working with a project in conjunction with several artists, each one contributing their own layer or USD content to the final result. What I'm going to be focusing on today is actually how we get assets inside the market scene and what presets and what templates and, and what structure we used to provide that. And also having a look at how to keep things simple if we wanted to choose so. Um, Obviously, complexity in pipelines when you start working with uh, several people is required in order to manage changes. So what the agenda is for today is looking at geometry prep and exporting into LOPs, authoring materials, and also primitive variants, uh, which is a USD, um, uh, USD composition arc that we'll be looking at that's very powerful where you can creep a single asset definition and have multiple variants of that asset definition. Um, we can also take a look at exporting primitive types to LOPs, um, different types of primitive types, any, everything from polygons to nerves to volumes. We'll have a quick look at that as well. So how do you get your assets inside of the scene? And then finally, looking at how geometry deals with LOPs themselves. Um, you know, how do we get attributes on geometry into LOPs? We'll have a look at that throughout the exercise. So on to geometry prep and export. Um, we can add attributes and metadata to primitives to improve, definitely improve our quality of life in LOPs. You can use defaults, but by understanding just that one uh, level underneath the defaults, we can actually create uh, primitives inside of LOPs that encourage us to do um, extended work and actually to support these assets throughout the lifetime of a project. Um, I found out that once you create an asset inside of Solaris, um, the first shot of, of importing the asset really should be a good one. So as a department in terms of modeling, um, by taking that geometry and prepping it just briefly and bringing it into, into the LOP context, you can save yourself a lot of trouble in, in a lot of revisions and rewrites. Um, and also uh, the key part of that is working with name and path attributes. Mainly the path attribute is the one that uh, you should key on to create um, the, the proper way of building up a scene graph tree inside of LOPs. If you're using SOPs, that is. Um, it's important to note that also when you're importing geometry from Maya into Houdini, as a Lembic or FBX, it'll actually have the scene graph tree as constructed and Maya kept as you bring it into Houdini as either a name attribute or a path attribute or both. So understanding how to work with name and path, um, usually with an attribute wrangle, is pretty straightforward and we'll look at that. Finally, the usefulness of geometry groups. Um, geometry groups create this thing called the geometry subset primitive type inside of USD. It's a, it's a minor subset. It's actually not a part of the USD composition arc, but it's useful for simply applying materials. And then configure lop, uh, taking a look at the configure lop versus uh, SOP import lop um, and seeing how the two compare to each other and managing materials. How do you manage materials in this authoring and also variants? So let's have a look at that next step. So here is a simple snapshot of um, a simple import of a barrel asset. And we're going to be picking on this barrel asset for the next hour, um, tearing it apart and rebuilding it and uh, seeing all the different variations. Because once we get one primitive type singing inside of USD, we can apply that uh, whole, um, just apply it wholly to all primitive assets that are coming into this project. Um, in this particular case, we can see that um, the primitives are defined here in the scene graph. Um, this is actually a Solaris screenshot showing a SOP import of the barrel asset and then a USD ROP that writes that asset layer to disk. And here we can see there's the attributes on the left and the barrel on the right. So key things to note inside of USD. Uh, primitive and attributes really are the two primary namespace objects in USD. Everything else is secondary. You compose scene graphs uh, by adding primitives and attributes. Um, and primitives are the primary container object inside of USD. There are a great many number of primitive types inside of USD defined by schemas, uh, but we do work with primitives inside of USD. And 
Attributes on the primitives contain the real data. So the primitives are just the containers. Then the attributes actually add the artist-derived data that, that contain on the primitives. They also contain data that you might add additionally to support these assets in a, in a, in a pipeline, in a studio pipeline, or as an individual artist working with a small team or by yourself. It's good to note that you can add uh, your own data to here as well as work with the existing data. So now, as we all know, primitive are the primary container object type inside of USD. And primitives are the primary namespace object in USD. Attributes are second to primitives. And primitives can contain other primitives. Um, and this creates a namespace hierarchy on the stage. And finally, primitives, along with the computed indices, are the only persistent scene graph objects that the USD stage keeps in memory. So these are the, the rules, the main overriding rules that we have in dealing with USD. So as long as we know that the composition of these primitives, how they relate to each other, how they are nested inside of each other, um, that's all kept in memory. And everything else, the attributes on the primitives themselves, can remain dynamic. And uh, we'll, we'll have a look in the, in the later presentation that I do later on in the day, uh, the subtleties of all of this, what I'm talking about right now. So the basics of authoring geometry in SOPs. Um, we have the Houdini geometry context where we deal with SOPs, path and name prim attributes. And we also have SOP geometry print groups. Those are our two main um, authoring tools for exporting into USD. And inside of USD, the SOP path and name uh, prim attributes actually can drive USD assemblies, groups, and components if you so wish. In other words, it's just a primitive hierarchy that we're creating, uh, or primitive scene graph hierarchy, based on the simple uh, path attribute that we can create. And it's important to know that primitives, primitives and attributes key are the key namespace objects inside of USD. So this path becomes very important uh, if we want to limit the amount of composition that we need to do inside of stage. And we'll have a look at that example uh, very soon. And then USD subcomponents. Um, they're, they're just simply face sets you might know. Um, they're convenient ways of assigning materials to parts of your model. And that's pretty much all they're limited to. Um, as part of the USD pipeline, uh, subcomponents are a side note or a footnote. But as an artist and a, a texture artist um, looking to get control over the modeler, sometimes it's nice if the modeler, uh, when they author um, their their geometry, that uh, they just put down an assemble SOP or or as they've constructed geometry, created groups that uh, pertain to materials as primitive groups. Then it becomes very easy uh, for, the, for the look dev artist to then assign not only materials at the root level, but you can actually assign a material to any primitive related to your geometry at the very top, to a general material that applies to everything, and then as you tunnel down the directory, you can do that. So here's a quick screenshot of what it is we wanna do in the next few minutes, build this up from scratch. This is the custom desktop that I built. Notice how on the left-hand side, it's all SOP related and I created these panes and I used this linking mechanism to make sure that they're all linked up. And here we have a file uh, SOP that's importing our BGO geometry off of disk. And it came with a name attribute, um, didn't come with a path attribute. So I used an attribute wrangle, which we'll see to just simply create the path um, that's used. And then um, I used an assemble operator to create a piece group per barrel in case one of the staves uh, on the barrel, maybe you wanted to uh, put a trans, uh, you can't transform these geometry subsets, but you can apply different materials. Maybe you can apply a different bit of roughness to it or change some of the shading properties to it. Um, and, and it just gives you the opportunity to do that. Plus, if I wanted to explode this barrel later on, guess what? My, my pieces are already set up. And, uh, but in that particular case, I'd have to promote these, uh, instead of using geometry subsets, I would turn them into actual meshes so you can actually transform them because geometry subsets only contain, uh, can only be used for basically shading. They're basically read only. You can see in the compose scene graph, there's a display flag on the, on the, on the mesh itself. And uh, that's what's being derived by the path over here. And then uh, below that, you can see all the geometry subsets that are created by that group. And uh, let's dive in and have a look at that. <laughs> 
So here's the scene file that I used to create that first snapshot. Um, on the left hand side, um, I've created a custom desktop that basically is focused all on SOPs. Um, you can see here there's all linked by the one. I use this um, when I'm splitting the desktops. You, you be, feel free to create your own custom desktops. Um, you can see I've linked one to all these various different panes on the left hand side that are simply focused on whatever work I'm doing up here. You can see as I click on the left hand side all the panes will update based on um, based on what I'm doing here. And on the right hand side is everything that I'm doing inside of LOPS. And I just happen to choose uh, two as the link. And you can see I've linked all these panes together. So on the left hand side, viewport, network parameter pane or network header, along with a spreadsheet and a parameter pane. On the right hand side, I've got the all focused right now on a stage. So this would be the Hydra viewport. I'm currently showing the Houdini GL delegate and I have a LOP network. I have uh, the scene graph details. Um, so as I select these particular operators and I select uh, items in the scene graph, I can see updates relative to this operator. I can see the scene graph composed. And then in the scene graph details, I can see whatever pieces of information that it is that I want to pick on. And the lower right hand side, I just have a simple parameter interface. And what we're going to do in the next few minutes is actually build this up from scratch again. Um, so I'm going to blow away these guys and uh, and then blow away these. First of all, blow away these guys. I'm going to keep the file up around and let's delete these guys. So here I just have a simple file operator that's loading um, a, a, dis, a, a file off of disk that's in the archive that I've been working on that I peeled out of the, 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 the full-on asset library, which is the barrel. And we can fully inspect this if we take a look at, uh, I'm just going to control middle on this, we can actually inspect what this actually contains. This is what the modeler would have given me. So uh, some geometry, um, lots of all polygons, um, just a couple, just a couple uh, attributes. There's a UV attribute, there's a name attribute, and then there's uh, obviously position attributes. So pretty, pretty simple piece of geometry. And we can inspect this in the spreadsheet. We have our points and our primitive name attributes. Now there will be some intrinsics involved in here. Um, if we go to, you can see here, there's a whole bunch of intrinsic data. Uh, we really don't care about that right now. So the first thing we can do is we can follow along. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to put down an output, an output SOP. And the output SOP is um, the way that we've designed the converter in Houdini 18 is that if we put down a SOP, a SOP import LOP, And the SOP import LOP, when we place it, um, we can now paint it at the SOP import path. Uh, we can drag and drop the output operator into the path directly. And here we have our barrel object. Uh, we can also back off a bit here and just bring in Geo1 and rely on this nat natural mechanism. Wherever we put the display flag will no longer have an impact. For instance, I can put a sphere operator in here and drop that down and I can move the display flag onto here. And you'll notice that this will robustly import the output. So that uh, means that uh, we have a certain level of security that if we do point just at the geometry object, we can actually rely on this output operator to always give us the right data, something that I usually do. And it's also nice from the artist, no, I'm just pointing at Geo1 and no matter where I place this flag or wherever I'm doing work, um, I already know I'm going to put it the output. By the way, that goes for all the SOP uh, nodes inside of LOPS that import geometry from, from the SOP context. So um, now what do we have? Um, in the Compose Scene Graph, we can see here that, uh, let's move this over a bit. Uh, we can see here um, we have... Uh, a uh, simple bare, bare, bare bones generic path that's being generated for us, a uh, scene graph hierarchy. Not at all what we want. We actually want to have, ideally, to have a barrels, uh, barrels assembly or group and a subgroup of the barrels and then the mesh. So we want to have this traditional uh, hierarchy that we have. Let's see how far we can get by just going to the primitive definitions themselves. So here we have uh, kind authoring. I always turn this on and I default to nested geometry, assembly and components, 
And in this particular case, um, I want to have the base mesh as geometry. So you can see there's uh, different ways of defining this that support most of the options that you have. You can do all geometry as one component. Um, that would be handy is if you just want to deal with everything as a geometry container, as a component geometry container. Components are equivalent to geometry uh, operators. In, and remember, kind is just a hint. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a built-in mechanism inside of USD that can identify uh, um, positions within the scene graph with these primitives that we've been talking about. And so I can actually go on here and I can say nested groups and components. So for this particular case, we now have a group which is, uh, I could actually put several barrels down in here now and they'd all be contained inside of this subgroup. And you can see that it's actually using the name of the operator. So we could change the name of this operator to barrels if we wanted to. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's immediately updating. And so we can do that because the import uh, path prefix is set to dollar sign OS. Um, we can also set that to barrels down here as well and override the name uh, itself. So we could actually go in here and we can type in barrels. Now, the care of caveat, and we can change this back to import geo, for instance. And we can now see that the barrel scene graph in the, but the problem we also have is there's really no name on the mesh down below, the hierarchy down below. Um, so there's, there's, we can improve upon this. And one of the things we're going to do right now is we're going to put down a uh, attribute wrangle. And the attribute wrangle is going to give us the ability to, to build uh, that path attribute. So um, we can see we already have a name attribute. So in here, we're going to run over primitives. So I found that it has to be primitives. And we're going to bring, export a string s at path. So we're actually going to create a path attribute. And inside of here, we can actually hard code our full path if we wanted to slash bell barrels uh, uh, with no lid version two, let's say, and uh, semicolon that. And then we can see here, all of a sudden we have, um, and we have to put a trailing slash, by the way. And now we can see that it's changed what's happened over here. Um, so um, now we have uh, barrels. And uh, so we've actually been able to override the name of the barrel, but we still haven't got con full control over the path itself. And so, and now we can actually try um, doing that string a little bit better. So I'm going to, I've actually got a string pasted. I can copy in. And so now with the string, you got slash barrels, slash barrels, barrels with no lids version two, and then barrels uh, with lid mesh, uh, barrels, no lid mesh. Um, and we can replace this last part with the actual path, with the actual name attribute itself, uh, barreled uh, no lid mesh if we wanted to. And the way we would do that is we can remove this last string and we could just use basic string concatenation inside of uh, uh, VEX. And we could put in here um, um, S at name. And then that'll concatenate the last name on it. We can see here now that the, the path should be properly formed now. And again, we can actually see here how the path is being delineated inside of here. So now we have um, barrels, barrels with no lids, barrels mesh. And I'm going to go back to here now uh, with the kind authoring. And I'm going to change this to nested assembly groups and uh, components. So now we can see we have an assembly of barrels. And within that assembly, we have a group, barrel no lid. And then uh, we finally have a barrel no lid mesh. Now let's say we wanted to create those shading groups. Um, we can see here that if we select the various different barrel components, we can double click on any one of these staves. And if I turn secure selection off and uh, select some primitives, um, you can see here that this has actually got manifold geometry on it, which is excellent. So now to get this, we can actually use an assemble SOP. It's the easiest way I know to create pieces uh, from within our barrel. 
Now the assemble sop is a pretty powerful tool for exporting into into uh, lops. It has a few options on it which are quite interesting. One of them is which um, we could actually go down in here. We could say create pack geometry. And when we do that, um, pack geometries come into um, lops as as instance type prototypes. But we're not interested in that right now. But what we want to do is create groups. And if I middle mouse on the assemble, we can actually see we've now got groups going from piece zero. And there's 37 of these prim groups, so I know I have 37 components or, or shared groups, um, unshared groups within my barrel. And there's an option on the actual uh, SOP import lop, as well as all the other SOP uh, type import operators, if I go to import data. And um, if I do want to create these, um, these subcomponents, there's an option called here subset groups. And if I know all my groups are correct, I can just put a star in here. And now what that does is it indeed does give me these, um, these various uh, uh, subset groups. So you can see there's a geometry subset now. And if I s sort of scroll this over a bit, we can see here that in the display options, we can control the display of various different primitives within the Hydra view. And we'll talk a bit about how this is happening and how uh, the scene graph evaluates these things. But uh, we can actually turn on the display of these various different barrels and we can change things. And, um, and it gives us a lot of control over what we do with the scene graph. Um, but you'll notice that these geometry subsets are basically hands off. They're just good for doing um, uh, material assignments and, and, and the like. Um, so it's your choice whether or not you want to uh, export that, um, whether the modeler gives us these groups or we have to create them ourselves, and whether or not the texture artist wishes to see these. The nice thing about these geometry subsets is, remember we talked about the USD composition, uh, the way USD composes things is based on primitives and then their attributes. Um, these geometry subsets actually are not a part of the composition arc per se. Uh, they're just simply a property of this particular mesh primitive. Um, think of them almost as attributes that give us the ability to slot and put materials in there. So in this particular case, I'm going to leave them in there. Um, do they offer any overhead? Uh, not, I don't, I don't think so. Um, if you, if the material, if the shading artist requires this delineation to assign materials, then that is what uh, they're, they're going to have to have. Now there's a couple subtle things that we need to uh, have a look at. Um, earlier on, I showed how you could use the import path prefix to define uh, what the root of our hierarchy is. Um, if we have, um, in this case, a path attribute, and it's preceded with a slash, so the, it basically starts with a slash, it's assumed that this path attribute is actually defining a root on down. If we omitted the slash in front of the barrels, then it's considering it a relative path. And then this import path prefix will then take effect. So um, so with SOPs, they have these little idiosyncrasies, um, things that you have to learn as you work and use USD. And these are one of the idiosyncrasies with working with USD. And, and that if these uh, jump through coming in actually have a leading slash, then it'll completely ignore this, this import path prefix. You can see it has no bearing on the composition arc itself. Now we can go to the attribute wrangle and try this out for ourselves by removing that forward slash. And sure enough, we now see that because the forward slash has been omitted, this merge uh, path prefix now becomes dynamic. In other words, I can now place it wherever I want. So in this particular case, I could then take away the barrels from the path and end up with the exact same thing using the import path prefix. And remember, it defaults to $OS, which is the name of the node. So again, you could default to $OS and just name your knob, uh, your node here barrels, but you're at the mercy of a copy and paste for, for, uh, for duplicating things. So this is one of those things that's always going to be interesting for you. For instance, if you load in an Alembic archive and that Alembic archive has a fully formed path with a slash as the first part of it, um, or a USD path, you can remove that slash. Uh, 
um, with an attribute wrangle, um, as I did here, um, or you can reform that path, remove the first slash, and then you can now control what the root is right inside of these SOP imports. Um, lots of subtleties involved with the composition of USD. Now to reiterate again, USD uses this uh, scene graph composition as a uh, a fundamental part of the composition of the graph. Instead of USD, you can use relative paths or fold paths. But suffice to say, if I was to, as a, as a modeler, now release this geometry down the pipeline, the next step would be the texturing side of things. And it's nice to have, um, you know, a, a static or at least a, a predictive uh, hierarchy that the texture artist needs to work with. So let's move into uh, the part where we now want to add materials. And we have choices everywhere. Um, we can add the material on the geometry. And there is a way to import these material assignments inside of inside of LOPS and do our look dev inside of the sub context. Um, that's if you're using Houdini to model this geometry. Uh, it would be the case if we had a procedural generator for hundreds of different types of barrels, which we've done here. We have uh, two different barrels, one with uh, lid and one with no lid, and then we could actually build this barrel procedurally and generate 20 different variants of this barrel, um, which is a completely different exercise uh, that I might look at one of these days, is rebuilding this barrel uh, completely procedurally. Uh, that's not part of this. So the one thing we're going to do now is add a material over here. And we're going to add a material network. And uh, with that, a combination material lop. So tab. So in here, tab material. And let's just shove our material in here. And just beware that this operator is set up to also delineate based on shop underbar material path if the path isn't fully resolved. Just beware of that. Um, but we can see here that it did add a shop material path on, on our output. And uh, once we assign the material, that is. So we're going to go inside of the material network. Um, the materials are being created. And so we're just going to put down a principal shader. And uh, let's stow this. We don't need to see all the inputs. We're not working on the inputs. Um, um, this There was a material built inside of Substance that uh, coincides with this material. And in this case, I'm just going to raise this up here. And uh, we're now going to go into the, the texture slots. Uh, before I do that base color, remember we multiply by default internally in our shader, so always be aware of that. And all the other multipliers as well, so we're going to be in reflectivity and metallic is going to be overridden. I think that's additive. So if we go to the textures or multiply, so um, we're going to actually use the texture in here. And inside of this texture path, um, we actually have, um, uh, let's go to hip. And under here, there should be um, uh, barrels to USD. And inside of assets, uh, barrels, um, textures. Um, and since this is a barrel with no lid, we can see that uh, the texture artist has actually added three slots for us. So there's um, repacked barrels with lid, repacked barrels with with no lid, and no lid version two. I'm assuming that the no lid is going to fit in with our no lid barrel. So let's do the first version, double click inside of here. And here we have all our uh, textures. By the way, in the preferences, I have display uh, texture thumbnails on. And uh, the one that we want to pick, of course, is going to be uh, base color. Now this is a UDIM material, and notice when we bring this in, it's going to come in not as a UDIM material. Um, if we go to the very end, we can see here. Um, let's say first of all, if I use dollar, so I'm going to actually in here. Yeah, good. So and uh, so in here, I'll just uh, that's it. And at the very end, we'll notice that uh, there's going to be. Um, um, uh, it's going to be a dollar sign F4 or dollar sign F because it thinks that that UDIM locator of 1001 is actually a frame range. So if you replace that dollar sign F, if you don't know about UDIMs, it's pretty straightforward. It's just percent open bracket capital UDIM close bracket D. So we're going to have to replace dollar sign F with this. And I'm just going to copy that. <clears throat> 
And now the boring part about assigning all the other texture slots. We do have a roughness texture. Let's pick that. So there's roughness, accept. And again, we have to go to the end and replace this dollar sign $f with, um, with our variable. And there's also metallic. Um, there's some metallic pieces on there, so this was added as well. Um, and there's metallic. Now, all of this can be automated um, if you need to uh, via the PDG. Again, that would be an interesting exercise to have a look at as well to see how you can automate all of this and build these texture slots for you. We also have a bump and normal map, so I'm going to enable this. And in the texture path, um, we have a normal, which would go into the bump slot. And again, let's replace this dollar sign F. And finally, under displacement, because we had a height map. And under here, there's a texture slot that allows us to apply our height map. So there's our height. And again, the UDIM, we have to replace that. Control V. So let's call this um, uh, barrel no lid version one. And let's go up. Now we need to assign this material to our barrel. So um, just pick our material from our internal material net. Barrel no lid, press accept. And we've got our successful material assignment. Now the one thing we're going to see is this import geo uh, lop does not have a way to actually load in the materials itself. It has so it can load in all the attributes for the materials, but it, it doesn't have the facility to actually introduce these materials onto the stage. We could put down a scene import, and in that scene import, um, we can actually set up to import materials and then merge it and then do all kinds of work. And at that point in time, I'd rather just create a local material network inside of the, the LOP graph. There is a much more convenient way, and that's um, called um, SOP create LOP. And the SOP create LOP um, is very similar to the SOP import, but it expects all the geometry to be constructed directly inside of the SOP create. So, um, now we're now we're faced with the big decision moving forward is we worked in an object container in slash geo and we used the import geometry but now we have to ask ourselves um, maybe the best way moving forward is to now do all of our construction directly inside of a lops which is what we're going to do um, for this particular case so I'm going to grab this hierarchy or these sops control C them and in here I'm now going to go and uh, we can actually go to the stage and we can actually dive inside of the SOP create. And so now I've completely changed context and I'm gonna paste that network. We could also done a, an object merge, but then when we do that, um, we're, we're basically going to have to bring the materials over and do all of that. So we're now gonna build uh, the remainder of our geometry inside of the SOP create. So uh, to recreate where we had before, uh, import path, we now uh, know it has to be set to model so, um, or barrels because that's the way we've set our path. We've made our path relative in this particular case. And so now we get the parallels graph. We can now go into the SOP import options, uh, primitive definitions, uh, definitely bring in the path attributes if we want to, primitive authoring, nested groups and assemblies. And we need to, uh, Go down into here and input data. And uh, we're gonna turn off shop material path as a delineation. You can leave that in there and it'll actually just simply use any uh, subcomponents based on any uh, per primitive shop material assignments. We can leave that in there or turn that off if we wish to simply apply the material to the entire barrel, which is what's happening in this particular case. Now I just stepped away for a second because when I first created the SOP create, it wasn't building the correct hierarchy for me. In Houdini 18, uh, latest builds, I'm finding that, uh, remember USD was designed in, in a way to be creating generating caches. It's not 
very dynamic like SOPs are. And we're literally working with a cached archive. And sometimes you might get an update bug. These are bugs, but you run into them. So what I had to do is delete the SOP create and undelete it. And then finally, I'm now starting to get a proper path. So so sometimes you're in. That's, if you're not familiar with Houdini um, or not that much, the brute force way to rebuild an object is not to close Houdini to open it up, but many times you can just blast away the operator. The undo tree saves the nodes, and then when you redo it, it actually recreates the operators, and uh, it, it basically fixes sometimes these update issues inside of LOP. Sometimes you grab the entire scene, graph, delete it, undelete it. <laughs> Forcibly, if you have a large scene, obviously you're going to get the hit in the recomposition of the geometry into the viewport. But in this particular case, I had to do that to get my, my nice delineation of the mesh to get back where we were. Now, with the SOP create, it has the ability now to fetch these materials for us. And uh, so uh, in here, if I go to the materials tab now, it says autofill materials, and we're going to press that. And now it constructs the material for us. And again, we're seeing some minor update issues inside of the viewport. I'm going to turn um, wireframe, or I'm just going to go to smooth shaded now. And sometimes you'll see that uh, Houdini GL itself won't update correctly. And that's why we're going to go into here and uh, kick it, kickstart this with Karma. And uh, Karma will kickstart Hydra. Hydra sometimes it, it, you know, it, these are again bugs, right? Uh, but I'm just showing you in 18.0 the idiosyncrasies that you might run into. Um, so now we know that there are materials there. Um, and we're going to be talking about truth in USD and hydrodelegates in the, in the next presentation I do at the very end. Um, and it's very important to understand, uh, you know, with the complexities of USD. And for instance, our Houdini GL is still not updating. So let's stick with uh, Karma for the next little while. Now, as we're doing this, we can see that we now have the materials. Um, so we can successfully author materials inside of objects, but our hands are tied. We either use these scene import LOPs, which actually bring everything in for us, very heavy handed, uh, very little control you have or the hierarchy. The object network itself defines how the scene graph is comp composed. If you're fine with that and you're not working with other people um, that are using other applications that might have their own ideas to what a, what a scene graph hierarchy would look like, go for it. Um, you can use the scene. But I'm finding that in, in collaborating work with those in other applications and uh, building USD scene hierarchies, it's uh, to get this extra added control, um, you know, using SOP creates or, or SOP imports are the way to go. Now in the SOP create, we can see our materials. And uh, we've now got a first class barrel asset. And if we were to write this out to disk, um, we can put down a, a LOP, or pardon me, a ROP and a ROP, probably not a ROP net, but a, um, sometimes my viewport doesn't. So basically a, a, we want to put down a USD ROP. Wire that in. And now we can author this USD to disk. And I'm just going to author it right in my hip directory. I'm, and we're going to be, uh, so let's call this rel, uh, no lid version one. Uh, and uh, mat. So we know the mat's assigned. And we can also choose to save this as USD versus uh, USDC or USD8 or A for ASCII or crate. So by sending it to .USD, it's going to usually default to a crate or binary format, which would be a good idea given the fact that there's um, uh, some geometry in here and we haven't cached anything to disk yet. So um, this would probably be a good idea to use USDC in, uh, USDC in this case. And we can tip our hand. Um, by putting a C at the end. I found that a lot of production pipelines are delineating USD either by C or A and not just going by the generic .USD. That way you don't have to inspect it to see whether or not it's a crate format or a readable ASCII format. So um, again, talk more about that later. So we're doing it as a USDC and then we can save that to disk. And there are barrels ready to go uh, to be ingested in, in another scene down the chain. Um, if we did want to use the SOP import, though, and assign all the materials inside of uh, Solaris, so this is look dev inside of SOPs. Now we want to take a look at look dev 
inside of uh, LOPS. So for that, um, we're going to put down a material library. And we're actually going to wire that below our import geo. And let's see how this graph composes now. Um, nothing in the material library yet. And I'm going to double click inside of here and I'm going to steal this particular uh, material and double click inside of this material library and paste it in there and go back up. And in here, let's go back up. So, uh, so this is the SOP, remember the SOP container inside that this support geo is pointing at. And so now we got the material library. Um, and because this is USD, it's a cache format, even though you're used to Houdini being very uh, automated when we're dealing with SOPs and objects and everything's dynamic. It's, it's the contrary, it's the opposite inside of Solaris. Very purposefully, you have to author um, your primitives into the USD stage. And when you press this autofill materials, it's a one-time grab whatever is in there and then assign the materials, so autofill materials. And now we can see that uh, automatically it gets a purple halo and it's authoring its own layer. And here we have, um, you can see we have now the material directory folder and materials. And this can work for us if we want these materials to live outside of barrels. And this is a big question. Do you want these materials to travel with the barrels or do you just want to be in this general USD scene under us lock all materials? If we import this barrel and we write it at the disk and we import it into uh, another uh, scene, uh, the materials will automatically nest inside of whatever parent we put under barrels. And if that's the case, you might as well put the materials in barrels if you want. So how you do that is, uh, again, we're, we're concerned about uh, the, the composition arc inside of uh, USD, so inside of our scene graph. So we actually have material path prefixes being slash materials. Uh, we can change that to barrels. And if we do that, and uh, container path is materials, that's where we want it to be. And the material path is set to materials, so we can actually set this to barrels as well. And once we do that, now our material is inside of barrels. And this gets a bit annoying after a while. I mean, especially if you get like 20 materials inside this material library and you have to put barrels in front of them. There's composition methods where you can actually nest this inside of it, but for now we'll accept this, this little bit of an annoyance where you actually have to add barrels in the slot of every material you bring in. But having done that, we now got a material uh, bound into our barrels. The next step is we have to assign that material. We could do the material assignment directly inside of here. We could take, we can assign the material, as I said, anywhere within this hierarchy. We can put it on the transform, we can put it on the mesh, uh, depends, or we can actually put it on one of these various different pieces. Um, it's probably best to go up and uh, assign this to the actual group itself. And we could do that. And then you get your material assignment. You can see Hydra kicked in, it saw a, a change, and it now had to had to upload the materials and assign them to our barrel and render. So that's one way to do it. Um, I'm not gonna do it that way, so I'm going to delete that. And I'm gonna actually put down a material assign. Uh, so that's the second way that we can assign a material. And in this particular operator, we can uh, take our material path and our geometry which is again going to be our mesh geometry. And again, Karma kicks off and does a render. So that's the second way we assign a material. And the third way, um, which is a really nice way of doing it, is to use, um, and here we actually have a material linker. And the material linker offers us uh, a more artistic way of linking materials together and let's pull this over a bit. And here we no longer have to worry about the scene graph. We can do all of our material linking directly in this single uh, parameter pane. And we can take our material and then we can take in our scene graph, we can actually take our barrels and assign it that way. So choose whichever method you like. Um, this is the more manual artistic way. I've got lots of materials and I want to assign them to the various different components. I would use material linker. If I knew it was procedurally based and I 
having environment variables defining how the material slots and I've got an ad automated way of doing things, I would probably choose to use the assigned material approach where you can use environment variables to drive the material assignments. Although you'd have to somehow press this, um, procedurally press this autofill materials, which is all possible inside of the PDG, by the way. And so the material linker is what we want to choose. And I'm going to put down another USD ROP. I'm going to alt drag this USD ROP down and let's author our USD layer. And again, uh, Matt um, uh, version two. And then we can author this to disk again as a create file. And you will have noticed that there was an error flag, so I had to stop, figure out what it was. And, it, and the answer again, I mentioned before, delete, undelete, error goes away, author your file, you're all good to go. So sometimes uh, deleting, undeleting an operator will clean some things up. There was a spurious error. So having a look at different ways in which we can bring geometry in to LOPS is um, really important. We saw f just basically getting some geometry, bringing it in and working with it as an individual user, as a user of a small team. And you're in charge of the entire modeling and texturing asset pipeline. Uh, that's a good way to work, whether you're in modeling department or effects department or layout, or you're building assets inside of the, inside of, inside of your department or inside of your facility. Now we want to talk about collaboration and building a more robust um, way of working. Um, having, uh, you know, having more control over how we author things and what we author and, and where they go on disk. And the second thing we need to worry about is how we actually compose the scene graph so that it's predictable uh, throughout the rest of the pipeline. And we can lean on Pixar's own examples. I mean, uh, there was the kitchen scene. You can tear that apart and you can see how they built their directory f uh, structure inside of uh, the file structure and also how it composes inside of the scene graph. And there's generally um, no real correlation if you don't, or you can have it very tightly correlated. But as we know, authoring geometry and SOPs for export to LOPs, there's the three basic methods. Three basic methods. We have decisions and decisions, right? Um, as we saw before, we can rely on the shop material path to create scene graph, uh, scene graph tree as default and user materials. And it assumes you apply materials and SOPs and use path on our name string attributes found for more control as we saw. But requires a thought and a geometry pass. Um, and then the second method we saw is SOP and name primitive attributes use that drives use deassembly groups and components. And that can be proceduralized and made very elegantly. And that's the method that I use uh, these days myself. And the third one is SOP geometry prune groups uh, drive USD subcomponents, as we saw before, for shading. If, if the texture artist really does need access to those primitive groups inside of the assemblies, the sub-assemblies, you can do that easily. Now, um, as now configuring USD attributes on geometry is another important part of how that we need to work. Um, we need to take into account attributes on geometry. And we can take a look at the USD configure SOP and it can also configure LOP uh, attributes on these USD primitives. Or we can use a SOP create LOP and SOP modify LOP, which is what we were focusing on. We could have done a lot of that work inside of SOPs using a USD configure SOP. Um, that would be good as if you were entirely inside of SOPs and you need to author your USD data. And it gives you the exact same interface that you had with the SOP, um, the, the SOP fetch LOP. And uh, you need to inspect and overview all the primitive definition options that are available. Now, what about the caching to disk? Um, so right now we've been loose, playing loose, just writing a single USD a C a crate file to disk that represented the entire barrel that we were working on. But we want to build our, our USD on disk such that we can use layers to override and control um, where edits happen. Um, so for instance, if a modeler makes the change to the barrel and in the method that we were using, we were outputting everything, uh, you know, everything, including barrel and materials, uh, the asset on disk would then need to be reauthored from scratch, or we'd have to rely on really heavy USD uh, composition to uh, add a new material primitive and redefine that the way that we want. So it's, it's more than possible.
but it's not that elegant from a much larger pipeline point of view and sharing of assets. You want to basically have your modeling department outset, output its own modeling USD file, and then the materials as its own USD file, and then finally the material assignments as its own USD file. And then finally, to ship this into environments or layout, you want to wrap it inside of yet another USD file that references all of those various different layers together. So we're going to take a look at that composition arc in a minute. And so modelers and texture artists understand downstream department impacts. In other words, with USD instead of pipelines, departments now have to talk again. And uh, what's interesting with USD is that conversation, um, it does impact your, your systems and your developers who are maintaining the pipeline to a certain extent, but not nearly as much as it has in the past. So USD actually opens up some of those conversations to be between departments. And you define how assets get shared and you're relying on this USD composition. Uh, strategies for tacking edits, for tracking edits and versions, for sure. Um, and that's that whole notion about tracking USDC versus USDA that I'll talk about later on. Um, just to know that um, if you're doing an edit, it would be nice if it was human readable. And if it was a small edit on top of uh, a very large model, let's say you wanted to move it over two units, uh, just save that two unit move as a layer and you can save that as ASCII. And then when you, uh, then, your, then your pipeline can, can humanly read that or anybody can read that layer and say, oh yeah, this person moved this thing for two units. And if you added the right metadata indicating what it was doing, such as a, a helper note right on the USD primitive, people would even know why you did that. So this is an example directory file structure. Um, looking at how the Magic Market project was composed um, from Scott Keating and a few others, um, just by interrogating uh, the directory folder structure of the assets, it's easy to define a standard. And let's take a look at this, this barrel asset as a way of looking at a standard. So everything is in this uh, root folder called assets. And then we have a subdirectory called barrels. So in this case, it could be any geometry you have. It could be brooms, barrels, um, any of the other pieces that are in your scene. And if you add a new asset, just add a new uh, folder or container where you're going to put all of those different geometry types. And then uh, inside of the barrels folder, we have a folder for materials. And you'll notice that uh, in, in this particular Magic Market, Magic Market project, all the materials are .usd. Nothing's stopping you from formally moving this part to USDA. Uh, materials are fairly lightweight. Um, it's maybe half a, you know, 50 to 100 lines of, uh, of USD code to define your, your bare materials. Believe it or not, the, the network itself is encapsulated inside of USD as a USD shade network. And you can read that and you can see what's there. So it's debatable whether or not you want to save that as USDA or USD or C. But um, yeah, so create versus A. And then you have the texture folders. Um, in this particular case, uh, with the barrels, we have three uh, texture folders that were done in substance with lid, no lid, and no lid version two. So how do you represent these three, three, um, these three uh, versions of the barrel is going to be interesting inside of USD. We'll be using variants to actually finally compose uh, a barrel asset that comprises of uh, all, all the two different barrels, barrels with lids, barrel without, and also a version that has, without the lid, has two material slots. So I'll show you how to build that up. And then barrels with lid USD. So that's a geometry cache, and then barrels no lid USD. So these are the two main geometry files that we have available to us. And then finally, we have barrels asset dot USD. And what that is referencing is all the all the variants and all the material assignments. So that's what's, uh, or pardon me, that's picking up all the variants on the, on the models. And then finally, barrels.usd, which references all the assets and the materials. And barrels could be USDA as well. Um, the, you'll notice that the, the two geometry files, barrels with lid and barrels with no lid, are USDC or crate formats because they're heavy geometry files and uh, saving them as uh, crate files would make sense. So you could explicitly add these extensions to all these assets. I'm finding that a lot of pipelines that have embraced USD 
are indeed using USDC and USDA to clearly delineate what types of files are generated at different parts within the pipeline. And the main the main reason for USDA is it's human readable, it's also parsable, it's also can be diffed then, and you can actually diff changes. And uh, whereas crates are binary blobs. And, and there you go. So that's the goal, <laughs> is just to take our barrel and rework it up so that we actually have all of this in place. Now to contrast the file structure, this is the composition structure inside of the scene graph that we're going to try and achieve with those layers authored to disk. So we can see here delivering these barrels to environments, to layout, to whomever is, wants to digest these barrels and compose on the stage, this is what we want to deliver to them. So uh, at the root path, we have uh, a container called barrels in the scene graph, a scene graph location called barrels. Inside of that, we actually have, um, and you'll notice that this actually contains the variants. So this becomes our asset, barrels. And we'll notice that it's a group in this case. We were authoring it as an assembly before. So um, that's a slight change as well, a subtle change. Yes, uh, USD is all about subtlety when we start to scale <coughs> things and we're looking at uh, coordinating between multiple people. Um, so barrels, barrels with no lids, that's the actual um, group. And that's the, that's the container for our mesh, barrel load lid mesh. So this, composition down here below is driven by, believe it or not, the variant. And the materials um, also are available for us is where we can see in this particular variant, uh, barrels no lid is the material that is being assigned to this barrel. So if we change this variant up on the top here, the composition of this will all change. And we'll talk about uh, composition arcs in the last presentation as well. We'll take a look at this and we'll see how all of this works with regards to variants and the other um, uh, the, the other composition arcs inside of UST called LIVRPs or L I V R P S and that stands that's an acronym that stands for all the various different composition methods inside of UST. But this is what we want the scene graph to look like when we're done. And uh, so. Um, this is the actual worked up file that we want to take a look at. This is what we want to achieve in the next little while. We're going to build this up and see all the different choices that you can make as you're building up this graph. Uh, notice that, um, that we have the composed scene graph exactly the way that the snapshot, um, I took that snapshot by the way from the actual market scene. So as a goal that we need to achieve and then reworked it all up um, using uh, a LUP graph. You can see it's a lot more involved than what we were looking at before. Um, and as I said before, if you wanted to create um, um, a bunch of barrels that are basically driven by variants, we at SideFX are building population tools that work with variants. For instance, we have a scatter tool inside of LOPS that will use, um, it'll expect uh, variants to be on the actual primitive that you're instancing and it'll create variations based on those variants. So if you had three variants, it'll randomly scatter those three variants across your tools. So <clears throat> we're going well beyond of just creating a few barrels that you want to place in your scene render and go, go forward as you would in a smaller shop. We're now thinking large pipeline, uh, large, assembly, large assembly needs, and, and so on and so forth. But you can see here in the graph, in the red is where we actually, uh, we have a bunch of SOP creates now, uh, which we introduced in the latter part of the, of the previous uh, Houdini session. Uh, we have these reference operators, which is a USD composition arc strategy where we want to take our primitives, create the SOP there, our geometry primitives, and add material primitives as a reference to each one of these operators. And then down below, we have an add variant operator, which basically create a variant of each one of these three barrels. So anything we put in this barrel will become a part of that variant. <coughs> if, we had a, if we wanted to have one barrel that didn't have a material, we'd simply bypass that or remove that, and that one particular variant would not have material. If we wanted to have one variant that had five barrels in it, we could do that, or, or another barrel, that, or another one that was actually a simulation of the barrels. We could add another version of that later on or add it to the variant as well, so we could actually have some anim an animated version of the barrel in here as well, which gets tricky with, with motion segments, but uh, regardless, you can actually do that with variants. And then finally, the configure layer, which is uh, where we would write these barrel assets dot USA to disk. And you notice here in the sub creates, um, we're actually inside of here, we sneakily put um, uh, 
uh, we authored USD right from here uh, for the actual barrel geometry that we referenced in. And so here we're uh, writing out the, the barrel assets. Here uh, we've got a configure layer that's writing out the, the materials to its own uh, USD layer that we saw, uh, that we record in the material path. And then finally the wrapper that contains all of this that references all the various different variants, uh, references the materials, and references uh, from this point forward. And then you can author the USD and then our job is done. Wash our hands and then move forward. So the next little while, we're gonna build this up from scratch and see what all of that entails. So this is the final file that I worked up looking at all the assets as they were composed for the, for the market scene. And it basically follows a template that is available in one of the example files that we ship for USD on authoring variants. And it follows a very similar pattern where you bring your geometry variant in and you add a reference of the material. You can see the scene graph composing carefully as we go. And we can do the material assignment with an assigned material. And then we just have a point holder here that then drives into the add variant which builds us all of our variants. And then we write uh, all this layer of composition changes to disk, and then finally we wrap everything together by referencing everything into a single wrapper down here. And what's nice about this is uh, we, can, um, we can basically right click on here and we can choose different variants that we want. We can see there's no lid. And you'll notice that it inserts a set variant operator in the graph for us. And then we can also see the variants. And if you don't like this yellow highlighting, the option over here in the viewport, uh, pardon me, in the still bar over here, turns that highlight on and off. If it gets in your way, you can turn that off temporarily. And then you can right mouse, you know, right mouse and change your variants. Or we can go to the actual set variant lop as well. And we can choose what variant we want from there. So, and, uh, Variants are a part of the formal USD composition arc, which means um, they're, they're under layers, but they're above payloads, which means that um, if I loaded a payload and I loaded in a variant, the variant would win. But if I brought in a new layer and sublayered that below the barrels, I could overwrite the barrels with a new one and the variants would obviously and rightfully be superseded by that, that last layer variant, or pardon me, that last layer um, that we put on. So layers are above variants in the, in the list. But anyway, we now can, can do this. So let's actually start building this from scratch. So the way I'm gonna do this, I actually have a prepared file. And I'm gonna open up where it's GeoStart. And let's see what I've created to start off with. Um, so in the SOP create, um, inside of Solaris, uh, we can see we just have our simple uh, humble barrel asset. Uh, and we actually have a file in, uh, we have the barrel with lid and the barrel without lid. All is bgeo.sc files. SC is just a compression format that is pretty good and pretty fast. And uh, then we do an attribute wrangle. And in this case, I'm using the path, which is barrel with lid at name and barrel, barrel world at name. For some reason, no lid. So I'm actually took a look at the standard that was established in the, in the, in the asset hierarchy um, and uh, just trying to forensically copy that as we move forward. So that way this file will actually author first class barrels. So it'll work with all of the other, uh, files in the scene. So it's, uh, you know, at the vagrancies of artists, artists using names as they go, creating definitions as they go. And then the second pass, you can start nailing these things and come up with real standards. So this is what we've got. And what I'm going to do now is these are the two barrel pieces of geometry. Remember we have two barrels and three, three, uh, textures, uh, uh materials that we can assign to these barrels. And, um, I cheated a bit and I actually grabbed uh, the material library <laughs> from the other file. So if I double click inside of there, we got all the different materials. Remember how we did it in the other video? Um, we replaced the dollar F with uh, percent UDMD right here. So I just saved all the all the bother with that when we created uh, the three materials that reference all the various different textures for the slots to save us some time there. 
And uh, so in the sub create, I'm actually going to want to create three sub creates. But let's, uh, I'm just going to create a second one first of all, and dive into the first one. And we're going to do this one as the barrel with lid. So let's blow this away. And we can blow the merge away. And here's our out. Remember that out node, no matter where we put the deflag, will actually drive the output for the sub create. And sub create two, we're going to take away this branch here, and we'll just leave ourselves with the barrel no lid and wire that out to the operator. So um, I think we took a look at how to build this, so we know that by now. And uh, then we're going to do a third sub create, which is the, another barrel with the no lid. So um, let's work on this first one. And we have the materials here. And uh, looking back at our graph, we know that we author these materials to disk. So what I'm going to put down here is a configure layer. And the configure layer is a very important node. Um, when we do work inside of uh, USD that's on, pre, on other elements on a pre-composed scene graph, we usually want to um, put our changes in very carefully. And the configure layer gives us the ability to actually save a path. And I'm going to pick on here and I'm going to go inside of the um, side of, uh, let's actually go to dollar hip. And let's go inside of assets. And inside of barrels, there's a materials directory. And this is what we want to write to. Even though I have it written already, we're going to overwrite that. So we want to save that to barrels, materials.usda. So, and notice how it's in the path that we talked about, assets, barrels, and materials is our Houdini resolved path. And so um, now that our materials are into the safe path, we can save all our materials to disk in the configure layer. And we can start new layer down here if we wanted to. Um, that's, also, that's also a very good idea. What that means is that um, this is the end line for all of these particular edits. And we can basically put in here, we can write materials to disk. You can be as elaborate with your name as you want. And so that, so that means when this starts to, when we author or write out this whole graph and this gets all wired in, it's going to do that. Now, we use a reference lock. There are all kinds of different ways of um, merging USD. Uh, the reference gives us a lot of control over how referencing happens. And we want to bring this uh, material into a reference on our first barrel. And again, careful to see how our USD composes. When we press on this, um, we can see that the reference wants reference files. So we're going to do reference from, from multi-input. And now we can see here that um, the material gets actually slotted under geometry. And we want to actually have it go under the barrels. And another thing we want to do is the parent primitive type is not a transform, but it is actually um, scope. So um, the parent primitive type, it's not, materials don't really have a transform to them. Um, transform spaces are usually defined by the application of the shader or geometry. So scope makes absolute sense to apply to our materials. And as we saw with the primitive path, we can actually drag and drop these barrels if we want into there. And if we do that, now we can see that uh, our materials are being dumped inside of this particular reference. And uh, that gives us a lot of control as to how these materials are placed. But we want to put them inside of a local materials directory. And one of the things we forgot to do on the materials operator is press on, uh, yeah, we should have pressed autofill materials just to make sure all the materials are created for us. Sometimes I'll actually clear this completely out because you might have some stale references to materials that were deleted. Um, autofill may not get rid of those. And then we can reauthor the materials and then uh, this will be written to disk, which is good. And we go back to our reference. And now we can see that under barrels, we have materials and materials. And we can see the primitive type is type scope. And then there's our three materials that are being assigned to our barrel. And um, then after the barrel, we can put an assigned material. And uh, let's do our material assignment. And the material is going to be assigned to the barrel with uh, no lid in this particular case, or the barrel with lid, I'm sorry. Uh, 
and we'll assign the material barrel with lid material to that particular operator. And then we have our material. And select these two nodes, Alt, hold down the Alt key, drag, um, sorry about that, didn't want to do that. Uh, drag these nodes, hold down the Alt key, and uh, create two more copies. And let's wire this link into there, and that link into there. And let's fix all of the, now we see that we have barrels referenced in the same position. And then instead of doing material assignment here, um, we should get a warning in that, uh, okay. And in this particular material assignment, we now wanna do um, barrel no lid. And let's pick our barrel no lid material. And uh, of course, Houdini GL isn't respecting that, but if we go to Karma, it'll update for us nicely. And then finally, in the third reference, we're all good. And from here in the material assignment, again, we can do barrel no lid again and apply version two of that material. So now that we have them all together, um, we can now put an add variant. And the add, oh, didn't want to do that one. So, yeah. So add variant, add variants to new primitive. And we can wire these three variants in. And as we do that, we now start to build, um, you can see right away we have our variant set. And if we right mouse on this, we can now choose um, uh, different variants. And we're actually now picking the three different paths, but the names are horrible. And we'll see here that the names are assigned material one, two, and three. And guess what? It's using the name of the input LOPs in this uh, uh, variant name default, which is um, pretty, you know, it, it is what it is. So, but we can use that. And we can actually put down nulls, null LOPs down in here. And we can call this one barrel with lid. and uh, alt drag that one, drop that on the second wire and let's call this barrel no lid. Now um, I'm actually following uh, the work that was done by, I believe Scott who did a lot of this. So I'm following his conventions, um, which is important when you're working in pipelines is uh, you gotta see what others are doing and, and follow along and uh, repeat ad nauseum. So in the third one, we're gonna call this barrel no lid version two, capital V2. And then we know, and if we go back to this ad variant and we go to the set variant, we'll know now, see we have um, nicer names. Uh, barrel, and this is off your screen, but we can choose it from here and we can right mouse on here. Sometimes it, it's a bit tough for me here. Yeah, right mouse clicking and then barrel no lid version two or so now we can we can author this asset and give it to the world and and then everybody can reuse it however they want. Um, so the final step is how do we write out the barrels? So what we want to do now is uh, let's put down a configure layer and in this particular configure layer, let's author this part of the graph to disk. And we're gonna call save path. And inside of this one, we're gonna put in dollar hip under assets, barrels, and barrels asset.usda, ASCII. Um, and uh, that's because this is not gonna contain any of the geometry. The geometry will be written out the disk here, which is something that we're gonna have to do now. Um, so under this one, we can put down uh, uh, layer safe path. So this will give us the ability to author the layers from here. And again, dollar hip assets, barrels, barrels with lid.usdc as a crate format. And I'm gonna copy this, Control C, select these two, 
enable that, control V, and then we'll edit as we go. So in this one, we want to change the second one to read barrels no lid. Now I have to be very careful here <laughs> because if I'm building these assets on top of a pre-existing scene, I wish to use this file to do further work and I lost the hip file, so, so, which is what happened in this case, the hip files go away. Um, you have to recreate this and that's why standards are so important. So uh, no lid, or you can introspect the generated USD, recreate it like I just did. If you know this, it's, it's, it's very straightforward to, to do. And it just takes a bit more work and it's annoying. Um, and then uh, no lid, this particular USD file was called no lid underbar v2. So why wasn't the first one called underbar v1? Yeah, it's, it's good. It's all good, following conventions. So now we're actually authoring. And there's also another uh, option down in here. So once this layer is saved, um, you can see here that the, um, this reference is now being brought in. This layer is being written to disk and the barrels. This is where we're writing out uh, the configurator for the set variants. And then finally, we put down uh, a lop rop. And not, not a lop net, but. Uh, and I'm just going to pick a uh, tab. And I'm going to pick a USD rop. Put that down. And this is where we're going to put out our final file, which is going to be called um, dollar hip into assets it's barrels barrels.usda. And let's save the file. I'm going to save it as um, I'm going to call it end whip, so we know end cord so we can compare the two afterwards and see if we made a mistake and finally there's record we can save this to disk and now we've authored all of our layers to disk again uh, we've now got a system that will allow us um, to, to make changes as we go and this opens up the discussion how important are hip files and Houdini files in the authoring of USD it's safe to say, looking at the Pixar documentation of USD already going back two and a half years, when we were first embarking on this project and looking at how to configure USD, um, the use of Python scripts and custom applications to reauthor USD files in place and also build bridges and tools was a very common workflow. And what LOPS represent is a replacement or an augment to those Python scripts uh, and C++ applications that we're using to bind and build and cobble together USD as it moves through the pipeline. So we now have a lop graph that expresses those USD steps in, in exacting detail. And um, so that means that this lop graph now replaces our Python code in the pipeline that was used previously to assemble USD or applications with wrappers in it. So that suffice to say, this network now becomes very important in the generation of our USD. So these same file, I will always save right alongside the assets. So you can see here that I've saved it in, um, and it's outside of the screen capture. So let me go file, save as, and I'll show you where I'm saving this file to. Um, and I could have just done hip safe path environment variable, but um, um, we can see here that I'm saving it to um, right inside of the, the barrels directory. So there's my barrels to USD directory and I'm saving it right alongside the assets. There's my local asset directory where all the geo is saved and all the textures are inside of the asset directory. So I'm actually saving the scene file as I consider it to be as important as the actual authored USD. So that means as a model editor, if I wanted to now cha make changes on top of this, um, I could brute force make a change to this graph, reauthor it, and it will overwrite the existing USD layers and not track a single change. <laughs> so what you could do in this case, let's say I've authored my barrels and somebody has, well, I have a change note that I want to apply to these barrels. You could do this. You could put down a layer break and you could work directly inside of this network if you wanted to. And let's say you wanted to add um, some more materials. So you could actually put down another material library and uh, very carefully graph that in. 
and um, then you could write this out to disk with another USD. Uh, actually, because uh, I'm having problems with my tab of mine for the last little while. Uh, you can wire this in here, and then you can save this in the materials directory, the same place that you did over here. So you can actually grab this, control C. And then in this USD ROP, you can control V. And inside of here, let's put in here, uh, change note. Uh, let's say it's change note 245. <laughs> whatever whatever you use to capture these things. Another thing I can do is by taking a look at this material network, I can see here there's some materials and I added a new material in here. Um, let's add a, a principal shader. Not a print fob. Principal shader. Now let's call this foobar. Go up. And in this material library, we can say autofill materials. And we can now see that we got foobar added to our scene graph. Um, and this becomes really important now uh, because we can, we can take a look at the material library. But how do we know that this is new and this is not new? Um, we'll take a look at that in the, in the next video. But to, long story short is we could write mouse on here and take a look at lop actions. And we can take a look at inspect active layer. And in here, you can see here that the only thing we're doing is we're just authoring that one material as an over. So we're inheriting all the, so basically we're just applying an over of the material. So this is what we would be authored to disk as we did USDA. So you can track, see what overs materials, what's the name of the material, where is it located? So you can grab all of this information as you check this change in as well. And if you really wanted to, you can actually use some, um, 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 you can do something really funky like do an uh, attribute wrangle and you can actually add some data to that particular material foobar if you wanted to so you can drag and drop foobar in here and you can put in here s at uh, uh, my let's say note underbar my ticket number it would be your actually ticket number <laughs> let's say 45 or whatever. And you can put in here um, added uh, for uh, new barrel simulation later down in the stream. So let's say somebody in simulation wanted to do something funky with the barrel and they exposed some insides that I needed to create a new material for on one of the variants and reassigned it and, or at least give them the material so they can reassign it themselves. And if you do that, um, you can actually take a look at your actually foobar material and you'll actually take a look here under, um, you can actually see here, there's your note. And this is a primvar, uh, which we'll take a look at later on as well. But anyway, there's your note as well. And of course, if you author this to disk, you now author that new layer and then it's part of the assembly. Somebody installs that, that that new layer authored in and they can pick it up or we can compose that inside of the final layer down here as a change as well and bring in everything else and it gets layered in up here. Um, lots and lots of flexibility as to how you can author these changes. In this case, I'm relying on uh, the pipeline itself to, to put that in or if I was with the smaller shot, I'd graph this change at this particular level, adding the material changes down there. And uh, I think that's pretty exhaustive look at, <laughs> at uh, how you can build a first class material asset or, or piece of geometry uh, as a primitive with variants into the mix. So the next area you want to take a look at is exporting primitive types, um, taking a bit of a diversion away from the market scene um, and exploring how all the various different primitive types that are available to us in SOPs and how do they come inside of uh, USD. Um, as we know, we're going to take a look at polygon points, pack primitive NURBS and volumes and a couple others as well. And um, seeing how they come into USD and what sort of um, state Houdini 18 is at this point in time with regards to importing uh, scene assets into LOPs. And I just want to say one thing. Um, this is an active area of research and development. Um, the next release should see a measured improvement in importing scenes to and from 
uh, Solaris as we uh, flesh out more and more of the pipeline. Right now, it's an excellent way of getting geometry into SOPs and out into LOPs, and very good at um, doing, uh, you know, SOP modify LOPs inside of the network to uh, work on existing a geometry and introducing new geometry within the LOP graph. Um, obviously, we need to make uh, making more improvements in this area can only enhance uh, traditional Houdini users uh, experience with LOPs. Um, so let's move forward. So exporting primitive types. Um, there are, uh, we want to compare Houdini and USD architecture with respect to primitives. And uh, there is the Houdini geometry primitive architecture, which is, um, and our architecture itself actually supports the addition of new primitives. Um, that's how we added packed primitives back in the day. It's how we added poly soups. Um, so via the HDK and a lot of careful surgery by our developers, um, we can add new primitive types. And uh, we and existing SOPs, if they need to work with that data must be taught what to do with the new primitive data, which means invariably new parameters if we must. And of course, um, that's why saving these things for major and point releases is always uh, the major and the one point releases is always important uh, for you to, you know, when working in production, so you have to work predictably. Um, new SOPs added to work with these primitives as well. So for instance, when we added uh, VDB grids, we added add a whole slew of VDB operators that, that were to, to properly express all of the open source work done at uh, DreamWorks and Camus at, at the time, working very closely with our developers. Um, what about USD? Uh, all USD primitives are defined by schemas. And these schemas are addition of new primitives via schemas open C and plus C plus plus. You can add new schemas. Side effects, for instance, uh, helped out with the support for VDB and our own volume primitives. And delegates need to know what to do with these schemas. So in other words, it's all about the viewport delegate as to what happens. So comparing Houdini primitives to USD primitives, here we have a Houdini box circle tube sphere. Um, and yes, <laughs> and any of the missing prims, like for instance, uh, Flippy, uh, the, the rubber toy, we covered them with a digital asset and toruses. So um, you can tab type a tori right in the viewport inside of the side of Solaris and you get yourself a torus. It's just a wrapper on the HDA. So we've done that. And geometry printer groups are USD subcomponents as we saw before. Poly soups come in as USD sub D components as well. And then height fields are, uh, they do come in, but they're not really supported at this point in time in, inside of Hydra. So it's probably best to convert them to polygons at this time. And uh, missing Houdini primitives, uh, metaballs, convert to polygons, uh, and some more of the more powerful tools are not currently represented inside of USD's cached format, such as procedural render time primitives. We have to do workarounds through Hydra and Husk. To, Husk is the command line version of Hydra for doing command line rendering. Um, SOP operators, procedural payloads. Um, we know that USD is looking at, uh, the USD team is looking at procedurals and how to incorporate them inside of the USD world. Procedural payloads with a parameter interface. So, and then CVEX procedurals. Um, there are, we can save them as shader graphs, but we have to do workarounds right now to get them going. So let's have a look at what that looks like inside of Houdini. So here I have a prepared file that we're going to take a look at and uh, see how the scene graph composes as we work forward. Um, I'm going to pin the stage and I'm going to pin the, the stage details as well as we dive into these SOPs and have a look. So in this case, we now have a file operator and this particular file is of a the, the good old barrel asset. And in this case, we put down an assembly operator, but we created packed geometry. And let's see what that looks like when you output it. Um, so packed prims resolve themselves as the actual hierarchy to the packed prim. So using assemble in this particular case to create our, um, our, our assembly and prototypes is pretty cool. And we have complete control over how that comes in via the, via the, the import data and how you can bring the partition attributes for, for that. Um, the second one we want to take a look at is poly soups. Um, so poly soups are pretty easy to generate. Um, we just use an assemble operator creating groups and then we can use a poly soup. And a poly soup now gives us 45 poly suits representing all the barrel boards. And again, if we go up, we can see here that the poly soups are represented as, again, as uh, subcomponents. So um, we can see here. Um, so they, they do come in as subcomponents of the actual geometry if we open that up. And it just comes in as meshes.
uh, so polysoups are supported. VDB grids, that's really interesting. So here we have a VDB surface grid. And um, this case just created a simple network that builds a VDB grid out of the squab. And take a look at that. It's called, uh, it's actually called surface under the name attribute. And let's have a look at how that comes in. So that's supported as well. Um, now, if we save this to disk, for instance, um, when we save this to disk, um, there is an attribute you can add to the VDB grids um, that will save it to a specific spot. If not, it gets uh, saved as a sidecar separate VDB data that's actually referenced directly into the USD file. Um, but that is definitely supported and supported by Karma as well. Um, and also supported by RenderMan, hopefully. And so moving on to the next one, and you can see there's my volume primitive. Um, so let's go back to Unity Gel, and let's take a look at some volume. So in this case, I have a cloud asset um, that I just used the cloud tools on to build a simple volume. Again, if I middle mouse on the output, you can see here I've got uh, one VDB grid and its density for the clouds. And that comes in as well. And you can light and render these. It's, it's quite fast inside of Karma. And then finally, our own volume primitive is actually supported as well. And so we've got a schema that supports our own volume primitives. And again, they get saved as separate files, sidecard and referenced into the USD uh, middle mouse on this. You can see there's density. And uh, so there's your volume data. So Houdini volumes can be used um, inside the Hydro Delgate. Now, um, if there's a discussion as to about what your renderer can support and what it doesn't support. <laughs> so obviously RenderMan most likely won't support our volume formats, uh, maybe Redshift. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that comes down to this whole truth argument as to what is truth and what is not and what supports all the features of USD. But Karma definitely does support um, those volumes. And then finally, um, we can go to height fields. So I'm going to go back to the Houdini GL and go to height fields. And here we have some height fields of a, of a canyon that I brought in from the shelf tools and space A. And uh, we are going to have to convert that into polygons for it to come forward. So um, the volume, what you'll just get is a flat plane and uh, with no height information applied. And this comes down to that art discussion about procedurals and what happens in extending Hydra to support these more, uh, these, these different types of primitive types in time, right? So we have to convert it to polygons. And uh, so there's your height field as polygons coming in. And finally, uh, and you can, and then finally, NURBS, how do they come in? So there's NURBS and Beziers. Um, the, here we have an output. Uh, so you can actually have a torus and a sphere. And then we can go and go up again. And here we can see there's the torus. And they're actually supported as mesh primitives. So there is direct support for NURBS and Bezier patches and the primitives. And if you want to know all the primitives, and finally, here's points and points are supported as well. And I do know for a fact that they're supported by both uh, uh, Renderman and Karma very well. And we use P-scale on the points to derive the radius of the spheres. So as Karma spools up, I can go down here and tab type um, the primitive. Uh, the primitive lop, oh, I didn't want to do that. Tab. Primitive lop. Um, it actually is a good place to go to see how many different types of primitives there are inside of USD, and it's running right clear off um, of the capture screen. Uh, but you can see there's basis curves, which are what NURBS curves are converted to by default, by the way. Um, blend shapes are supported, uh, geometry lipes, Houdini field assets, uh, Houdini. So there's a lot of specific stuff to support uh, Solaris in there as well. NURBS curves, as I said, NURBS patches are supported as well. So if you really want to see the full complement of USD primitives, just put a primitive sub tab type. But, uh, and then we can use the RenderMan delegate as well. And it fires up and renders the spheres. Really fast time to first pixel because Hydra already cached the data. And uh, Karma and RenderMan can both use that directly. And that concludes um, our, my first look um, for today's uh, Worldwide Hive uh, workshop. Um, and uh, 
taking a deep look at asset preparation and ingestion into slurs and USD, looking specifically at the barrel object. And it, of course, applies to all the other objects in the scene. They follow the same uh, approach. For instance, all the vases of themselves are also variants as well, and they were constructed the same way. Um, thank you very much.